Let's pick up in verse 12. This tells us how we got into the situation we're in. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. He was Adam number one, Christ was Adam number two. He said, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Let's read one more verse, and then we'll pray, then we'll get into our study. <clears throat> For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. One put us into sin, one will take us out. So we all fail by Adam's transgression and we can all be made new or alive by the beautiful atonement what Jesus Christ has given us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you today in Jesus' name for the precious word of God, for the promises that are given to us. Uh, Lord, speak to our hearts tonight and help us to see you uh, high and lifted up honored and glorified and soon coming back. And Lord, you're coming back for what belongs to you. So we pray through the doctrine of atonement that every single one of us under the sound of our voice could hear that they can have their sins atoned for if they will accept by faith the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood at Calvary. Uh, God, there's people dying all over this world that do not know that they can be free from the judgment that was passed upon through Adam. Uh, many people don't even know they're under condemnation. Even though the Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, many people think that's just an opinion. So, Father, in these last days, in these days as they are, uh, please help us, oh God, to reach out to those that are around us. A gospel track will go a long way, but our testimony could go even further by us sharing God's love and grace to a lost and dying world. Thank you for all you do. Have mercy. Send help, O oh God, in these last days. And Lord, I pray those who have not been delivered, Lord, would hear the message of grace and they could understand they can be forgiven. They can have a brand new life. They can have a new beginning. So, Father, all we can do is offer. And it's up to you to bring conviction, to open up the light of their heart, that they can see that they are the one that is in need of salvation. Please help us tonight, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for your standing. The doctrine of atonement, it's what Christ, the act of his love, seen in totality, what did he do? One man had literally taken us away from God. One man came thousands of years later and fixed a plan whereby the father and, and the children could be brought together in the form of a mediator and that act of love of grace is called the atonement. Something has happened for us, but let me tell you the good thing about it. 
You don't have to accept it. You have a free will to say, I want in on that. I want to be free from the condemnation of my sins. I don't want to pay for them. I don't want to be judged for every sin I have committed. Well, that's wonderful because someone has already paid that debt for you. So why should there be two debts paid? So think about this. Everybody that has left this world unprepared, they woke up in a Christless eternity called hell. So now they are in the process of paying for the debt of their sin. They are paying eternally. It's bad enough to be separated away from God, and then it's even ten times worse to be in a place called hell, not only separated, but being in torments. I think Luke 16 said that he was in torments, plural. Many sorrows and pains and screams and torments. So what a shame that he had an opportunity to bypass that, because as Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores, was no doubt crying out, uh, you need to be saved. God loves you. Uh, you need a new beginning. I don't know what Lazarus said, but it absolutely did reiterate into this man's heart. He didn't do anything while he was alive, but as soon as he passed on into the place called hell, he realized what that man was telling him had merit. It had support. So all he could say was, well, he didn't say, well, can you help me now? So he did say, let him, Lazarus, go to my father's house for I have five brothers. And I want him to tell my five brothers what he was trying to tell me and I wouldn't listen. So Father Abraham said, no, everybody gets the same opportunity Someone will tell him of the gospel and they will have to choose just like you did. So the atonement has been made. The blood sacrifice has been offered to the Father on the mercy seat. It's been accepted as payment in full. You're free to go. Now, the only catch is that you repent and accept this atonement. And many people, if we went to the Morgan County Jail today and we went in there and told everybody, you're free to go, unlock, 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 unlock. You're all free to go. I mean, you can run out of here. But suppose they just sit and look at us and say, what's the catch? And they sit there knowing how long will those doors be open? They're sitting there wondering, why would you do such a thing? And so in the process of time, eventually, that door closes. Now the freedom to walk out is over with. That door closing is a picture of death. And now while the door of grace was open, you chose not to receive. So the atonement price has been paid the Father has accepted, so you can go free. Well, does that mean everybody in the world is all going to go to heaven? I wished, but they all have to make a conscious choice. They have to come to the place and say, well, that's me. I have sinned. I have come short of the glory of God. I, I absolutely deserve the payment for my sin. But then they hear the message. Someone is already paid. You can walk out scot-free. You can go free. No strings attached. The atonement price, the ransom has been paid. You can go free. Look on your study. Atonement, the acceptance or satisfaction made by giving, now I want you to notice this word, an equivalent for the injury. So the injury was Adam sinned, and through the human race in sin, we are all separated from God. So the injury was made for an offense made, and the offense was against God. 
This also means to forgive, to clear up, to reconcile, to put back as it was or to buy back. Because of sin, a restitution had to be made by another who would absolutely be innocent and not be guilty of the same charge. So somebody that needed to buy us back had to be outside of the realm of the problem. Thank God Christ came on the scene. The atonement is a prominent concept with Judaism and Christianity, which holds that humans must atone for their sins against God. Somebody has to pay. The Christian doctrine of atonement states that Christ has, past tense, atoned for humanity's sins. Atonement is the process by which people remove the obstacles to their being reconciled to God. What is stopping me? Number one is myself, my pride, my stubbornness. I have nothing that will stop me other than the enemy, Satan, will tell you that God is a God of love. He wouldn't send anyone to hell. He's a loving God. Everybody is okay. You'll be all right in the end. If you'll just try your best, God will honor your trials and your tribulations. A center part of the Christian doctrine is that we know that Christ died for us. More specifically, it is held that Christ died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Christ's death is supposed to be the crucial element of God's plan for salvation. This event at Calvary, Christ's death making possible our salvation is called the atonement. Somebody has fixed the problem that the first Adam has made. And notice how I put this in bold letters. The damage of sin was so great that the entire Old Testament that the blood of bulls and goats and all the offerings under the law would never work. Why? Because the sin debt was so great. Even though the animals that were offered were innocent, they had no blemishes, they were a type of Christ, but it was never good enough. All it did in the Old Testament under the law was to buy time. And it gave them one year of freedom and then next year it had to be atoned for again. They got, if the, if, the, uh, if, if the priest would do everything correctly and it was accepted on the mercy seat, they got another free year pass. So all the years of the Old Testament, they were buying time, buying time, buying time. And basically, none of those offerings could ever take away sin. And I'm going to show you some scriptures. So now that we understood how the sin was a problem, uh, it would take something extraordinary, a sacrifice of a payment in order to reconcile humanity. This wasn't just a quick find a kid, go to the first year and without blemishes and sacrifice. It had to be something more vital. Hold your place, Romans 5. Let's go to uh, the book of Hebrews. Boy, if you want to know a lot about the Old Testament law, you can find almost everything you need in the book of Hebrews. So let's start out Hebrews chapter 2. And as we read this verse, I want you to see the importance of really where we were at that the sacrifice might be equivalent to set us free. So in verse 17 of Hebrews 2, it says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that's Christ, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted he is able to secure them that are tempted. Now go just a couple of pages over to Hebrews chapter number 9. 
I don't want to give you just a little bit more Hebrews 9. And let's look at verse 11. It said, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by our greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Now watch this. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Why? For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament or the Old Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, the damage was done. So all through the law, they were offering to God kind of what we would look at as a peace offering. Would you let us live another year? Because they were all temporal. It just lasted for a short time. And as you understand in the book of Exodus and Numbers, had the priest not have done everything correctly, uh, he would have died there at the mercy seat because it was still the law that had to be justified in the way that he was offering up the sacrifice. Look down in verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God, hath or, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood of both the testament and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without God shedding his blood, there would be no problem for us never being forgiven. But because the equivalent ransom was paid, it was equivalent or greater than, and because he was innocent, he could not only buy us back, but he could make this work for eternity, not just for a year, for Christ only had to offer himself one time forever. Now, understanding this, look in, well, let's jump down to verse Let's jump down to verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures or typology of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not yet he should offer himself often or more than once as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he uh, often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin. And how did this happen? By the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die. Now watch this. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's coming to pick and to bring home that which he has purchased. Wow, what a time. If you remember Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin, what is wage? It's a payment that's rendered. Uh, I work 40 hours a week. I get a paycheck. Services that have been rendered. I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is a payment rendered for the sins I have committed. But wait a minute. Let's look at the whole verse. For the wages of sin is death, but 
When you see the word but, it means that this first phrase can be changed. It's not absolute. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today I'm glad that Romans 6.23 didn't only have the first part. For the wages of sin is death, you're going to die in your sin. But thank God, a plan of atonement was literally laid out probably in early morning of, of the beginning, knowing that God would create man and man would disobey. And then man would be separated from God. Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. You cannot stay in the heavenly abode. As a matter of fact, in case you try to come back in, there was a guard. But at the doorway that says, no, you're not coming back in here. So the only way you're going to get back into heaven's abode is through the one that bought your atonement. He made a way when there was no way. Look at number one. Did Jesus teach on atonement? The answer is yes. Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. His atonement describes how human beings can be reconciled to God through his own suffering and death, and you can find out quite a few details in Leviticus 16. It tells how the offering had to be accepted and how it had to be perfected. Number two, what is the full atonement for sin? Isaiah said in 53 verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Does that sound like old news or new news? And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus being the innocent party would be made to pay in full the price to have mankind cleansed and forgiven. Through his suffering and death to buy us back from the slave market of sin, this was his mission in life, is to pay for our sins who knew no sin, that you and I could be made righteous in him. He became our substitute. He literally took us off the cross and said, I'll do it for you. He took our place. Number three, and we'll stop here. What is an example of biblical atonement? Well, there was a lot in Exodus, but I'm going to give you one verse, verse uh, chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it from out of the sheep and from the goats. And it goes on to say you to take it on the 10th day, watch it to the 14th day, and then you would sacrifice that precious little lamb. That innocent lamb that had done nothing, but that's what it took to buy you forgiveness for a year because the law was still instituted. Now think of this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed or bought back with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations uh, received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he took the sacrificial lamb's place that was done in the Old Testament, he came once and forever to offer himself a ransom to pay for my sins. And the Father accepted the payment once forever. Now, he never has to go to the cross again. That payment is so perfect, it lasts for eternity or it lasts until Christ comes back for the church and we don't need atonement any longer. So thus far, the damage was done. Christ came on the scene to redeem, 
to fix, to repay, to let us free, to get us out of jail. However you want to term it, we get to be freed from the condemnation that my sins put upon me. I would think that that is so unbelievable, the cost that I owed, and yet he looks at me one day and said, if you'll come to me, if you'll trust me by faith, I'll forgive every one of your sins, past, present, and future but you're going to have to trust me. You'll have to come to me. You'll have to repent of your sins and ask me to come into your heart and, and we can have a life brand new. It is called being born again. It's hard to describe the new birth. All I can tell you is this old person dies because judgment fell on them and that person died and was buried and thank God a new person was born again, born of the Spirit, and literally their names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, never to be judged or condemned because of my sins again. This is the beginning of this doctrine. It has a most beautiful picture of the ransom that was paid when we were put in prison. Something had to free us. The scripture said in 1 Peter, uh, silver and gold wasn't going to do it. The lambs of the first year was not going to do it. So one time when Jesus came to this world, laid down his life on an old rugged cross, and he presented the blood to the Father on the mercy seat, boy, God the Father said, paid in full. You are free to go. But then now, what is the catch? The catch is, do I believe it? Will I give myself to repentance with all the pride that humanity has? With all the young age that I think I've got my whole life, why do it now when I can wait? Because you don't know when the wait is over. You don't know how much time you have, if death doesn't come, Christ is still coming. And when he comes, he's coming for those he purchased, those he atoned for, those he bought back, got them off the slave market. Those are his, those who he's coming for. They're going to be those like the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were, help me out here, five were foolish. You know why they were foolish? Because they pretended to have oil. They said, uh, give us of your oil because our lamps have gone out. When the scripture bears out, they didn't have any oil. They had the lamp. The oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. So in typology, they were pretending to be ready for the bride, the bridegroom when he came. So the bridegroom came, the five wives that had oil in the lamp, a picture of the Holy Spirit, they went into the marriage supper. But the five that were, wise, uh, were foolish went out to try to find oil, and while they were gone, he came and he went. And they pretended to be just like everybody else. Here's our lamp, here's our oil, our lamps. We can't trim them because they're not burning. So they portrayed and pretended, and they paid the awful price. They did not get to go into the marriage supper. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Dear God in heaven, we pray that you'll always prepare our hearts, our minds, that we might share the wonderful good news that humanity, boy and girl, man or woman, no matter where they're at upon this planet, they can hear the good news, but they've got to decide, do I have faith to believe and will I accept? So, Father, for those who are not ready, please let today be their day that they repent of their sins, they invite you into their heart and life, and they can accept the free gift of a salvation, the atonement, the ransom that was paid by the offering of your precious blood. 
Thank you, dear God, for setting us free. Thank you for us experiencing grace, giving us something that we have never deserved. So thank you for all you do. Please have mercy. Forgive us of our sin and shortcomings. Bless this day. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.